Supporting people with mental health needs is always challenging, but it is probably never more poignant and apparent that there are challenges than when we are trying to support an individual with a chronic drug or alcohol dependency. And this might be part of the reason why there's a disconnect between people who work in drug and alcohol recovery and people who work in other aspects of mental health. And I think that's tragic because not only do each side of those kind of equations have a, be a body of knowledge and skills that each other can learn from, but also there are a considerable number of people, as we just discussed, who will come in the door and they will not be effectively helped just because of this perception that the clinician they've encountered is not properly equipped to deal with them. So there are some unique challenges, but I want us to understand that mental health workers do have something to offer to the individual with the drug and alcohol dependency. And the same is true of people who have drug and alcohol experience and are working with people who may have other mental health diagnoses. The skill sets are very, very overlapping, and it's important for us not to reject people because their needs don't seem to fit with our mandate. Now let's take a look at what some of these challenges are. The first one is one we just spoke of in the last slide. It can be very difficult to assess the underlying causes of a drug and alcohol problem. However, the research is beginning to show that it's less and less important, or it seems to be less and less important for us to understand what came first, the mental health disorder or the substance use disorder. And it's becoming apparent that it's important for us to take this collaborative, intensive, um, approach to supporting the individual in both ways at the same time. So medical procedures, medications for example, being used at the same time as psychosocial processes like counseling or family therapy. So it's critical for us to understand that we can spend too much time worrying about what came first. We have to abandon this idea that we can only support the person by discovering the underlying cause and then treating it and then going with the secondary issue. And that is becoming more and more obviously a, a boondoggle, a, a red herring for us to follow. We should just be trying to deal both issues at the same time. It can be very difficult to amass resources and assets for people, especially in a timely fashion. Let's be honest, for the person who is a very significant user of a substance, perhaps they're street involved or homeless, perhaps they're so psychosocial factors, for example, their housing, their employment, their family supports, are significantly depleted. That individual might be living in a, in a community where they have very little understanding of the resources. They may have lost some of their identification. They may have a bad track record in terms of interacting with some of the local medical professionals because perhaps they've done things like uh, behave aberrantly in their offices or drug seek or doctor shop. And so what happens in those types of circumstances is that the individual may have a very small window in which they're willing to go and seek out detox and or treatment. And if those services aren't available in that particular community at that particular time, it can be months or years before the individual is ready to try again. And, and it's a real challenge for us sometimes to amass those resources at that time. And it really means that we have to be creative, we have to be connected to each other, we have to know what exists out there so that we can make something happen on short notice. We also have to deal with uh, an underlying trait of substance use and dependency, and that is the symptom of denial. Um, I frequently joke with my students that denial isn't just a river in Egypt anymore. It's a foundational symptom of dependency. And remember we learned to talk about the idea that the drug has a voice to the user. And one of the things that the drug does is tell the person or reorients the person to what is considered to be an asset in their life and what is considered to be a threat. And so as strangely as it might seem to the non-addicted person who's associated to that substance, ad substance addict, the things that used to be friends and allies now have become enemies and threats because they are indeed threats to the drug. And the drug has become the biggest asset. The drug has become the biggest voice. And so the individual is going to be strongly in denial and sometimes the uh, cognitive framework, the constructs that that person has to make in order to believe that the drug is good can be rather remarkable. They can actually believe, for example, that the entire world is against them uh, because they're trying to help that individual get off of a drug. So it's very important for us to understand that denial is in itself a symptom of addiction and yet it's also one of the reasons why people often don't want to accept care.
And we'll talk more about how to overcome denial in the, in the following slides where we talk about stages of change. We also have to overcome stigma and community fears, as we've spent some time talking about before. We won't go over that in much detail here, but clearly we know that it is a difficult thing to get people to admit that they have a drug and alcohol problem because it is not just the same as admitting that one has a medical issue. It is a highly stigmatized, highly tainted thing for a person to say. Um, the individual during the, during the recovery time themselves will experience crises. Um, in particular, we worry about the first two years and especially the very first year of treatment. And we know that people take some time before they begin to develop dextra, dexterity in terms of navigating through life's challenges and resiliency, the ability to bend back or, or to flex as life throws troubles at individuals. Now this is a particularly damaging thing for people who have been chronic long-term users because they may have really lost many of the assets in their life. They may be financially in very dire straits. They may have very few relationships and so they're picking from a pool of people who may or may not be clean and sober, who may or may not be trustworthy and reliable. And so the individual is sort of more likely to run into relational problems, economic problems, employment problems and ongoing healthcare problems because they've probably been engaged in behavior that's been very hard on their system. And so you've got an individual who is, so to speak, in a raw state, and yet life is about to probably deal them some challenges over the next few months and particularly the next two years. And so it can be very difficult to help that person be ready to withstand some of these challenges that will come up during recovery. And here's an example of what we mean by that. Um, I, many, many of the individuals I've worked with over the years have, during the course of their active addiction, done things that have caused them to either get drunk while, uh, sorry, um, uh, intoxicated driving offenses, or to lose their jobs, or to, um, or to get into accidents uh, while they're under the influence. And as a result, they either don't have the income, or they have um, uh, done something where they have a whole bunch of fines or other restrictions that keep them from getting their license. So they go out looking for a job, but they can't get a job because they can't pay off their ICBC fines, and they can't pay off their ICBC fines because they don't have a job. And so they're in this really conflicted position, and they feel as though the world's out to get them, and they don't see that there is a way through this. Perhaps they can pre prevail upon somebody else for a ride. Perhaps they can carpool. Perhaps they can bus. Perhaps they can look for a job that's closer by. And so for many people, that's an insurmountable challenge. And people sometimes report that they feel as though uh, the world is out to get them. They feel like they've been kicked while they're down um, because they're just trying to get better. And at every way, at every stop, people are imp impeding them. Um, for example, over the years, I've had a number of people who have sought funding through local uh, employment agencies, and they've gotten the funding, and they haven't seen that as an asset. They've seen that as something that is requiring them to constantly jump through hoops, having to deal with this doctor and that other professional and submit this paperwork. And sometimes people are missing the idea that somebody is giving them something and asking for a little bit of accountability. So it's quite common for people to feel stressed by these things uh, because they haven't had much coping ability over the last few years before they sought treatment. There are a variety of social influences, and this is particularly true of the alcoholic because it's all over the media, it's, all, it's, it's available in almost every block that an individual can go and purchase these substances. And even for those substances that are illicit, it is very, very easy for people to get them. And it's sometimes hard for us to comprehend if we're not act addicts, if we've never been regular users of substances, how easily and readily available um, they are. And the customer service is pretty remarkable today for an individual as an active user. There's such competition for these drugs that people will actually bring them to you no matter where you are, they'll extend you credit and in fact when they extend you credit they often have made you so indebted to them that in some cases people will actually sell drugs for others or will um, uh, go out of their way to try and get substances through through crime so they'll for example break in or they'll steal from another user so they can pay off their debts so there are a variety of other social influences out there and it can be very important for some people to literally move away from some of their prior social influences 
but we must be mindful of the transition back. It's one thing when an individual goes off for two months of residential treatment for them to be clean and sober, and it's entirely another when they come back into the community and need to find um, a way of being and having respite from the drug or substance um, while they are exposed to it constantly. And it's because of all of these influences that we must be prepared to deal with relapses or what are commonly referred to as slips in the profession. In the old days, I remember many local treatment facilities having a zero tolerance policy where if an individual was seen to be using a substance or came back into the facility under the influence, they were simply told they could not come back into the program. And the evidence came back and showed that this was absolutely an ineffective approach, that we could not expect an addict in most cases to go from using a drug often every day, multiple times a day, to never using it again without any slips whatsoever. And instead, we need to be prepared to actually address those relapses or slips in a particular way. So in some cases, places came up with a policy where they used a consequence, where they said to an individual, you can come back in after a week or after a month. But even in some cases, those policies are being revisited because if you think about it, a policy like that is essentially the same as saying, we're going to leave you to the dogs for a week or leave you to the dogs for a month and have you be exposed to that substance without support. And instead, what we really want probably is to think about the fact that that individual may have relapsed, but they're coming back in the door to get help fairly soon instead of waiting for years or months before they come back and get that help. And so we should be, I think, in many cases, more responsive to that request. And we should be using a positive programming type of approach, one that really looks to reinforce and strengthen the periods of sobriety that the person has, as opposed to applying consequences for the periods that the individual has um, has slipped in. And, and I think you've got to remember that that individual, by coming in and asking for help, is saying that they're starting to understand the aversion to using that substance. They're starting to understand why it's not a positive thing in their life. The stages taken by a consumer before they even begin to consider therapy and all the way through the process, including after the individual has been successful through therapy and needs to maintain, has been studied by James Prochaska and it's called the transtheoretical model. Most often this is referred to in the field as simply stages of change. And it's largely applied to people who are going through recovery, and yet it's a perfect example, in my view, of how we might be able to support people across the spectrum of mental health disorders who might be reluctant to seek care. So what Prochaska did is he described a number of different stages, and then from there, um, how we might support an individual at each of these stages of change. And the first of these is called the pre-contemplative stage. And when the person is in pre-contemplation, they're not ready to seek care. So really, it's all of that time when an individual is actively using and isn't considering going and getting treatment. During this stage, people are not intending to take action in the foreseeable future and can be unaware that their behavior is problematic. And if, in later slides, we'll talk about how to deal with each of these stages. The next stage is called contemplation, which can be summarized as getting ready. People are beginning to recognize that their behavior is problematic and start to look at the pros and cons of their continued actions. For example, you might hear an addict telling another user, don't do what I've done, don't follow my pattern of behavior. The individual isn't indicating that they're going to get treatment, but they are starting to be aware that their behavior hasn't worked effectively for them. Preparation or readiness means that people are intending to take action in the immediate future and may begin taking small steps toward behavioral change. And we need to really hear that word small because we have to approach that person's readiness very delicately. The next stage is the actual action. People have made specific overt modifications in modifying their problem behavior or in acquiring new healthy behaviors. So for many people, this is the active process of seeking treatment or a collection of different treatments. And then there's maintenance. And this is what happens when people have actually been able to be successful through their treatment or action. And now people have been able to sustain action for a while and are working simply to prevent relapse or trying to keep things going. And then termination. Termination uh, means that individuals have zero temptation and they are sure they will not return to their un 
a healthy habit as a way of coping. And for some people, termination never comes, although maintenance may get to a point of being fairly minimal. There are some folks who will say that they never, ever completely achieve termination. So let's look at each of these stages of change. As we said, it really applies to many forms of change, not just addiction. And we need to realize that when a person relapses, it simply means that they're turning to an earlier stage. So we don't simply abandon that person and say, well, they didn't do what they were supposed to do. They haven't taken care of themselves. Ergo, we should wash our hands of them. We need to understand that like most things in our lives, our process is gradual and it will not be an overnight thing for us to go from ill to well in any circumstance. Just the exact same way as losing weight is a gradual process and will probably probably involve a few donuts along the way. The same is true here, only we're talking about something that is probably more unpalatable than donuts. It really is about a person making more progressive steps and fewer regressive steps as times uh, re regressive steps, I should say, as time passes. So the stages are not completely concrete or discrete. It can be difficult to tell whether a person, for example, is in contemplative or action because sometimes people are on the borderline and it's not always a purely sequential process. They have, people may have things happen in their lives or they may have a variety of past learning or insecurities that can play havoc with them. And so while a person may seem very convicted one week in terms of moving toward treatment, a week later they may feel as though they are completely unprepared. This is exceedingly common. I was speaking with somebody just the other day who said that she has helped the same individual on a number of occasions to get ready to go and try a new job and at the last minute the person is backed out. But finally, after about eight different attempts, the individual was able to move forward this time. And similarly, in another conversation with a colleague only about two and a half weeks ago, the individual was relating how they have often worked with, an indivi worked with individuals in homeless shelters um, who were seen very eager to go and seek treatment. And then after about a week, that eagerness started to wane and was started to be replaced by anxiety and self-doubt. And so they have learned as staff people to actually tone down some of the excitement that they have when that person starts being contemplative and starts talking about getting help, they try to keep it measured, reasonable, and be ready for the individual to demonstrate some anxiety. So the stages and our interventions should be matched so that we're maximally effective. We need to perceive what stage a person's in and intervene accordingly. And if this seems like it's reminding you of the crisis intervention planning that we did earlier around assessing the person's arousal cycle and addressing it, it absolutely should. As a pattern of behavior for every professional and every a lay person, I always espouse as taking this assess then address approach. Figure out what's going on and then apply the correct intervention. We have to always be mindful of this idea of self-efficacy. The person must believe that he or she will be successful in changing. And so there will be little eruptions of self-doubt as we go through this. Sometimes there will be very large eruptions of self-doubt as we go through this process. And we need to be ready to support that person in those moments to be able to, uh, to get through them. And it can be anything from silently being in the presence of a person and holding hands or rubbing shoulders and getting through tears, uh, or sometimes literally being quite blunt with the person or confrontational with the person. And it really depends on the relationship you have with that person and your assessment of them, which of those approaches you should use. It should not just be willy-nilly or random. We really should be trying to choose the approach that's suited to that person. We have to think about helping people around making a decisional balance. And this can look like a very rational, simple conversation in which we sit down and describe the pros and the cons of a person's decision. And we have to have a realistic orientation. In other words, we cannot expect people to go from being uh, an active, street-involved, criminally-involved addict to a person who tomorrow has a strong understanding of their social responsibilities and their self-care responsibilities. We have to take it one step at a time. 
One of the things that I like to do to help people during this time, especially if they're prepared to sit with me and have a conversation that will last 15 or 20 minutes, is to use an old sales technique, which is called the Ben Franklin Close. Now, the Ben Franklin Close, to be honest with you, is a little bit sneaky because it's used by salespeople to convince you that you should purchase their product. But this is how it basically works. You need a simple piece of paper, and you can make a fancy worksheet, or you can just take out any piece of paper and essentially draw a line down the middle of it. In one column you should label it as pros and in the other column you should label it as cons. So you're going to ask the person to start off by listing the cons, the reasons why they should not seek treatment or why they should not take a particular action that's been suggested in treatment. And let them come up with the list on their own. Respectfully and non-judgmentally receive whatever they tell you and write it down. And if you can see that sometimes they're saying the exact same thing, but they're changing the words, then you might want to suggest theming it. So, for example, if a person says something like, if I stop using this drug, I'm going to have to stop hanging around with my friends. And then later on, they say, if I stop hanging around, if, if I stop using this drug, then I'm going to have nobody who will want to hang out with me. You can say, well, that sounds like the same as point number one. Can we combine them? What you're going to do after the person has given you their list of cons is you're going to help them to do their list of pros. And you'll notice that I said now you're going to help them. Now it has to be ideas that they are prepared to voice, but you can certainly throw in some ideas. And the basic idea here is to have a longer, substantially longer list of pros than there is of cons. And at the end of this list making exercise, where now we are helping to augment that pro list, we want to get the individual to see the obviousness of the choice. And so for example, the sort of language that I would use at the end of that list making time is to say, well, it seems like a really clear choice, doesn't it? Or this is pretty obvious, isn't it? But we also want to give that person a chance to digest it. And so if the person seems resistant, then sometimes the best thing we can do is leave them with this concrete uh, entity, this piece of paper, and let them decide. And we can do this using a suggestion. And what I mean by a suggestion is just a simple, final, poignant message that sounds like this. Um, Mike, I'm going to just leave this with you. It seems to me like it's a pretty obvious choice. I'm going to leave it with you to let you think about it because I'm sure you're going to do the right thing or I'm sure you're going to see the obvious choice here. When you're ready, come and let me know and I'll help you with next step, whatever the next step is. And so we don't want to sound disrespectful to the person, but we do want to say, hey, I know you're going to end up in the right place. And voicing that little bit of faith or support with the person is often important. We too often try to do the hard sell. And then what that does is it actually makes people resistant to where we're trying to send them. It makes them want to fight for the power. And so we actually have to let people uh, know that we have faith that they'll make good choices. So there are many, many worksheets that are available out there, and you can certainly Google them. You can look at places like the Karma website um, or any number of other resources out there. There are many, many worksheets that let people go through this process. One thing you notice is not on my list here, and that is the intervention. And again, interventions were, and, and to some extent, still do remain very popular because they've been popularized in the media. But interventions are interesting because while they have an intensive approach and sometimes do cause people to uh, change their mind in that moment and go and seek treatment, they often don't have a lasting effect. And they can actually make people feel shamed and alienated from the very people they will need to support them through treatment. So what I like about interventions, the positive thing about interventions, is that it lets the individual know that nobody is prepared to enable their addiction any longer, that people are affected adversely by that addiction. But the idea of ganging up and having everybody flood that individual can be very challenging to that person psychologically. And in terms of professional conduct, I have some issues ethically with that. But the other part of it is giving people a chance to actually digest and think about what's said can be hard to do, but important to do. And it can be hard to do because we know that sometimes people just seem to go right out and use the substance again. But we have to plant seeds. And that's what stages of change is all about, planting seeds and giving people a chance to let those seeds germinate and pay fruit, a bear fruit, I should say. And and even though that sometimes doesn't happen as quickly as we would like it to, it turns out that those are normally the approaches that have the longest enduring effect that end up making the biggest difference in the long run. So what intervention do we use at each stage? 
in the pre-contemplative stage, we would say the person is generally greater than six months until they're ready to pursue action. And here's where we're going to encourage mindfulness. In other words, leave people with those simple ideas and let them think about it. We simply want to ask people questions and we want to provide factual education without pressure where it's possible. So if they're asking questions to us, then we want to simply answer them. For example, the question might be, what does this program do? Or um, does this thing actually work? Or what do they do in this particular facility? And a lot of times we're tempted to try and take that little thread and immediately try to unravel the sweater. And we're probably better off just to simply answer the question in a factual way. And the most important thing we can do is to establish a supportive, non-judgmental relationship where that person consistently comes to us and gradually will start to expose more and more of what their, their needs are and, and see us more as resources providing those particular assets. The contemplative stage is less than six months to action. Here the person needs help visualizing success, simply discussing for them things like what might it look like to get a ride to the facility or who might they actually meet when they get there. Um, would you come and visit them once a week? What would they do during their free time? Who would take care of their children, their dogs, or their job while you're in there? That sort of thing. And we're looking at this point of reducing that cons list. So go back to what we talked about in the Ben Franklin close and think about how you might be able to actually substantially reduce some of the things that are cons there. Then we get into the preparation stage, and here's where we're less than 30 days or so to action. And again, these are not always concrete. Um, here we're taking very small steps, and what we want to make sure is that we don't get people to commit to taking on an entire program or an entire commitment of two months or six months or anything like that. Instead, we want people just to commit to the next step. And we often want to let people know that we're going to review after that step and the person can always change their mind afterwards. So we're not agreeing that we're going to go to treatment forever. What we might be agreeing is that we're going to go in and we're going to meet the counselor. We're going to go in and fill out the form. And then after we do that, we're going to say, all right, are you ready to make the next step or do you need something else? And we're going to keep doing that for this particular period of time. And you'll see that the person gradually begins begins to gather momentum and it becomes evident that you don't need to do that checking in after each incident because they will let you know if there's something else. So this is often characterized by the person telling others what they intend to do and going around and asking people what support they might be providing them as they go through their treatment. And so again with mental health this isn't necessarily going to look like a person going into a residential facility but it still can look like the person saying hey I'm going to go in and uh, see my doctor can I get a ride from you can I get you to help me remember my medicines can I get you to kind of help me journal every day how I'm doing. The person needs to be able to plan and visualize what it's going to look like here and we can do that with them through journaling. We can actually in some cases help people if we have photographs and images or even if we can interact with some of the human beings that they're going to see there via telephone, via video conference or in a, in a setting that's neutral like a coffee shop or an individual actually coming into where you first are interacting with the consumer. So the others, the person from the treatment facility could come in and, and meet your consumer in your setting. During the action stage, this is the time when a person either is currently acting or they've been actively doing their treatment within the last six months. Here, it's very important to help the person reward their self and reward themselves and note their successes. So journaling is very important. Anchoring is very important, so people should keep stickers and celebrate uh, milestones and, and, uh, and have visual representation of the things they've achieved. Um, you, you need to spend time with this individual refreshing and setting new goals, checking with them on how well they've accomplished their goals, celebrating when that's been done, and then setting new ones. Um, have them do some mental preparation against relapse. In other words, planning what their steps are going to be if they start to be tempted. And this is called anchoring. In other words, going back and having a set of responses that work for that person every time. Choosing functional alternatives. In other words, having the person choose what they are going to do instead of what they're going to not do. It's not effective to say, I'm going to not stay in bed all day long. It's important to say, here's what I'm going to do instead of staying in bed. And if it's a place where a person has a social obligation, it's even more motivating because now there's somebody on the other end 
who can help monitor. We're going to avoid old deleterious patterns in socialization. So if we're supporting the individual during this time, it's important for us to be aware of them doing some, some of the things that in the past have been related to them getting in trouble. So for example, this might look like the person going into old neighborhoods or reacquainting themselves with people who were once a bad connection. Or it might look like what we call stinking thinking, where a person starts to describe some of their thought processes and you can see that they've become perhaps a bit self-negative or a bit complacent in some of the thinking they're doing and it will remind you to some extent of some of the person's thought patterns that existed before they began to seek action. Maintenance is the time after the action has occurred. It's greater than six months um, after that. And this is when a person has to continue healthy habits and avoid deleterious ones. Now we have to say this can be very boring for people. It can be a letdown because the process of getting well is exciting and people are giving us lots of praise and we're having celebrations. So as a support individual, we have to really be good at keeping mindful of people's milestones and making it very reinforcing for them uh, to, to continue to maintain this, make them feel special and good about that and help them to take stock of what's building in their lives slowly. Otherwise, it can be easy to lose sight of what's going on. What we call this is novelty. In other words, during the action phase, we have novelty. For example, we make a new friend, and that's a really concrete thing because it's novel. But what we may not have an easy time taking stock of is how that friendship may strengthen or how subsequent friendships may come along and may be more subtle additions to our life. And so doing that stock taking can be a very valuable thing to do with individuals during maintenance. And that can look with journaling, uh, sorry, look like journaling. It can also include staying in contact with mentors and supports like for example sponsors or anybody that's been a real resource person during that treatment and we have to continue to celebrate success and treat the continuity of success or continuation of success as an accomplishment in its own right and one of the most important things is helping other people now that the individual has become more self-sufficient they can take some of that and turn it around and give to other people. And we know that that, uh, that approach of social interest, of giving to other people, is very therapeutic to the individual. And termination, as we said earlier, is not always realistic. Many, many people, whether they have a drug or alcohol issue or a chronic mental health concern, will never completely get to the point where they can say they are terminating their treatment. They don't need anything else. They're fine and they're well. Even the person who has a mental health disorder and seems to return to mental health will likely need to be constantly aware every few months, every few uh, years in their life, just checking in and seeing whether or not things are going well or whether or not there are indications early on that there may be a need to maintain some of the care they had in the action phase. Now the consumer may terminate formalized help and then just maintain some psychosocial supports that are informal like family and friends and neighbors. And that's a really healthy way to go through these stages.